Just wanted to get started a little bit on our project before we actually start in class. Nothing more than that, just so I have a little something to talk about while we're in class. I'll probably start with fairly big. I want to show you how I use all my tools at the same time too. Putting together my mall stick. So you can see my mall stick here. Sec three sections, it folds up easily in my painting pouch. And I'll use this to steady my hand. Now when I'm working on my underpainting, which is what we're gonna see here. Over on my right, you might see it. I've got a little iPad where I put some of my photo reference. Now the image that I'm working on here on my left is a digital image that I did as a demonstration of this very same painting. So I'm just gonna use it as my reference for this at the same time too. I've already painted it once, so now I'll get to paint it again. Have fun, just follow along and then we'll talk about it in class or during our live session.
still not a tiny brush, but a nice round brush. Gives me a lot of control. This one is a round sable number 10. So, small enough that I can get the details, but I'm not worried about detail just yet. I'm only worried about laying in my values. That's what I'm after here, laying in values. And this brush has been used before, so it doesn't hold its tip perfectly. So it tends to make a nice, soft little painting brush. You can see how I use my mall stick now. I can rest my stick on my surface so I can steady my hand if I need to. darker than they need to be, even in my underpainting. Although you can see, I'm keeping things fairly transparent. So I can see through and see my drawing. And I really like the brush strokes showing up, especially in the darks and the shadows. I don't worry too much about perfect smoothness. It's all gonna get covered up with paint as they go along anyway. And experience will teach you that you can save yourself a lot of time not having to worry about it being perfectly smooth and finished, especially at this stage. What I'm trying to do is create a good value, meaning dark and light. But because I'm painting on skin, I will try to keep all my shadows very warm because flesh has blood flowing through it and it always looks dead if you add too many blacks or blues or greens to it. You rarely ever put green or blue in the face except in small, minute mixtures, primarily just to cool or neutralize a color, not necessarily make it blue. paint in this stage is extremely soft, very delicate, especially because I'm painting on a hard board with a very fine linen weave canvas. So the texture of the canvas will help pull a little of the paint off, but it's an oil ground canvas, which means the paint surface would be much slicker than if it were an acrylic ground canvas. You'll find with experience that the acrylic ground actually lets you manipulate the paint 
and it seems to or feels like it's drying faster. Chemically, the paint's not drying faster. What's happening is the chemical or the acrylic ground is acting like a mop. It's made of calcium carbonate in it, and it kind of absorbs some of the mineral spirits and oils inside your oil paint, making it feel like it's drying. What it really is is just stiffening. So you can dab and pat and notice those textures look very much like felt. That's what I'm after. I just want some texture in there to underlie my paint at the same time. So that's why I'm patting it in there nicely. transparent oxide red paint. Coming with a finer brush now, just to lay in some of those details. Again, these are not finished details. This is my underpainting. In my underpainting, I tend to keep everything a little lighter than it will be in the finish. Only because as I add more paint on top of it, my underpainting, which is like a watercolor, if it's transparent at all, it'll get darker. So I don't need to worry about painting it as dark as it needs to be right now. I'm just trying to establish values, patterns, and a little of this underpainting, that's the reason I'm going to the trouble, this underpainting will show through in while I'm painting on my finish painting layer. I tend to paint usually in three what I call skins. This is the first skin, the underpainting stage. I'll let it dry and then the second skin I'll put in local color. In other words, skin tones are going to be skin tone. You know, cloth color will be cloth cloth color, etc. In this painting, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to keep it in the browns and make it look like an old Dutch master painting, or if I'm going to make it look like I did in my digital painting and make it look like night. Now, if I go with the night setting, I will more than likely wait for this to dry and then paint a blue over the whole painting in a very thin transparent layer. So putting blue over my orange will what? It'll neutralize it. So a lot of these dark colors will just go kind of a grayish black like they do in the dark. And then I can paint in local highlight colors of the lamp and local color or whatever the color would be, but it'll all be heavily influenced by my warm undertones and my very cool imprimatur, or what I would call that nighttime local light color. Very cool nighttime color. The paint's very plastic, as I call it at this stage, so it's easy to manipulate, move around, change if I wish to. I have reference, but I always change. I, just like I would to anything in front of me, I'll react. I see what's in front of me. I don't necessarily copy everything that's in front of me. I pick and choose. 
I still have a little gnome. I'm trying to give him some character, some personality. So I'm interjecting stereotypes from my own experience, things I enjoy painting, age. I thought inspirational for gnomes. It's a Scottish landscape in the background. My wife came in. We're, I'm listening to something in the background while I'm painting. Beautiful music. And then there's landscape of uh, Scottish highlands going back. Getting myself in the correct frame of mind. Conversation a gnome would have with a little baby owl while he's reading and walking. Probably sharing some of his wisdom. That's why owls become so wise as they get older. They learn from so many. I think that's gotta be what it is. What do you think? Is he looking fun yet? Does he look like somebody you would like to have a conversation with yet? It took me a while to find the gnomes here in Georgia, you know? There are not many sea gnomes, not many gnomes along the coast. Gnomes tend to like the mountainous areas. So when my wife and I took a little trip up to Georgia, in the mountains of Georgia during the summer, we had been cooped in COVID so long that we needed a little getaway. And we rented a little Airbnb out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains and went on a hike the next day and discovered no. Little gnome homes here and there by the rivers. One of the other videos that I have on my YouTube page is a little mountain gnome home. A little fishing cabin. <laughs> it's fun to paint with your imagination and just let all those experiences find a place in your painting. Looking at this, here's where, and I'll do this today, but usually I would wait and then establish. But while the paint is still at a plastic stage, I think I'm gonna add some white and start painting in a few of the opaques. And just like I would the other oil painting, I paint from the darkest to the lightest. So what you'll see here is not as light as it'll actually be, and the color that I'm putting down is probably a nice middle value or skin tone, but it also allows me to start creating textures in the skin. So it tends to be a little bit more opaque. I think it needs to be darker. I want to build up to lights. And this is just that color. This is the reason I really enjoy the transparent oxide red so much. 
It's a beautiful orange color, and if it's too bright, all I have to do is add just a hint of blue to bring the temperature down or and neutralize it a little bit. It's always a little bit of give and take until you discover exactly that value you're looking for. But the paint's plastic. And that's the good thing about oil paint. It didn't have to be exact. I want to build up to the perfect lights. But you can see when I paint this way, the shadows might look like watercolor. They're so thin and transparent. But then as I build into the lights, they start looking a little bit more like gouache. So for you painters who are learning both, it just gives you a little reference as to what I'm talking about. Still some opacity, just a little bit of white to it to give it some opacity. You can see what I'm doing here now. Establishing a nice value in the base color. Yeah, I mess up a lot and I fix a lot and go back and forth. That's the luxury of painting in oils. Down a nice middle tone here into the shadows, just feeling safe, working my way around, patting it almost like I'm putting on makeup in some cases. And I'm just trying to get those nice little blends. My wife is the one who pointed it out to her students who were watching me paint one time. Describing those who wear makeup, and you know when you're putting on makeup, you're just trying to get that nice soft blend, and you have to pat it in with your makeup brush. That's kind of what he's doing here, <laughs> and I never have been able to think of it as any other way since. She's right though. Let's catch a little bit of that. Then that eye. Okay, it's just a little bit. Of Catches the light later. Let's blend that a little. Paint those eyebrows in a little fuzzy. Same thing over here, and I'll light them, lighten them up. This is the charm of working with oil paint. It allows you to blend. In working with monochromatic colors. And the thing you're really worried about with oil is it turning to mud. Well, mud is kind of what I'm after in some of these cases here where I just want a neutral. Right? I don't want it to be too light or too dark. I don't want it to be too orange or too blue. So mud comes out okay. And then I'll build up my values from here. Now that I've put that in there, that darker middle value, I can see that my dark value needs to be a little darker, but not much. Remember, everything will get darker in the final painting. 
but I don't want it to be black. I want it to be warm. So all my really dark warm, such as his nostrils, I'm going to paint with just pure transparent oxide red. Be a very nice dark yet very warm color. Painting a face. Something I teach in my portrait class all the time. Symmetry is usually how we measure beauty. So when I'm painting a face, in order to keep my faces symmetrical, or at least somewhat symmetrical, I tend to paint whatever I do on one side, I try to do on the other at the same time, or at least back and forth. It just helps me have a little bit more control and usually happier with what I come up with at the same time too.
just tickling, that's why my wife described, just tickling the brush, just patting and tickling, patting and tickling, and only trying to build up ever so slightly with values at a time. Sometimes I'll put it down, I know it has too light, so let me go down and make this just a little slightly darker version. see I've got the camera in there pretty close but I hope what you can see is how I'm trying to build up also the paint as I get lighter and lighter and lighter I tend to build up the body of the paint itself physically so that it has more paint on it and I build into the lights it creates this little three-dimensional illusion. In this case, the refraction on his eyeglasses right there and at the top of his cheek. Yeah. It catches the light sometimes in the eyeglasses at the bottom of the eyeglass. It gives you that almost oh boy Coke bottle look right there as it catches right along the lip the eyeglasses themselves. So he has little reading glasses on, as you can see. So I'm just ever so lightly bringing that up. I probably won't paint the detail of the highlight. I rarely paint any of the top highlights at this stage of the painting. But I always save those for the very end. They're just tiny little touches that can give so much depth. But I will go ahead and start painting a little bit of the value for his beard and hair here. This should go pretty quick. It's going to appear a little different in the light. 
Right there where it starts transitioning. That goes back to skin again, so now I get warmer. See, I'm thinking about all these things at every stage of the painting. And this is still the underpainting, but I can't help but think of those things. They're giving a little bit of attention to this detail now. It will work itself out even more so, and even more beautifully when I start putting color over it. Because so much of it is, acts just like an underpainting. It's just what it is. I'm putting and working out so much of this as we go. So I don't have to think about it in the critical stages later. This could be a little darker, I think, and a little more neutral. So I can see if I did make a same value, but it looks different because it's a temperature change, not a value change. Details and more, just get some paint on this thing. The paint, as you probably have noticed, is pretty stiff. I'm not, I don't put much spirits or liquid at this stage. Only in the very beginning, at the very beginning, when I first put paint on my brush and was mixing it up, did I add a little bit of liquid to my paint. And the reason I did is because I know that that'll help, I'm painting so thinly here, by tomorrow morning, this will be completely dry. And I can paint over this if I wish to. Look what I'm doing on that soft hair. I'm using the hair brush and I'm just pulling and lifting and pulling and lifting and pulling and lifting and pulling and lifting. And I'm really making very soft hair edges for hair. Now I'm just pushing it around, making some tangled mess hair. And you can see it's too dark. This is not the color of this beard. But when I pull white now, I'm gonna bring the white back into it. Now we can start thinking about what his hair color. That's a little too light. Go down in value. Some of this is just artistic license trying to get. Now I know from my painting that this light is angled. It would spill it and catch a little bit of this. I really want to catch the glow of the book. That's the reason it's in the book. 
And so what I'll do is I'll make sure some of that light spills over into the book, as if, even if it's being bounced back into the beard. So I'll make that a little bit lighter. I'm just not gonna put any detail in it. I don't need detail at this point. This is just hair. I'm gonna give some furness, some beard hairness, if you wish to. I'm going to evoke beard and hair with just strokes. And only later in the finish stage, if I think I need a few more wild hairs pulled up for detail, will I do so? I think I could do a little bit to the top of his mustache here. Keeping my brush direction for his well coiffured mustache. Does he look like anybody's uncle yet? <laughs> or grandfather? Maybe a father. During my master's degree, one of my professors, good friend, great artist, I've known him for a long time in our professional world, both in the publishing business, Dennis Nolan always saw him as a wizard, a little gnome wizard. This beautiful little smile, I could barely see it because it was always covered up with a pretty thick mustache and beard. Kind of a wild hair, slim, mostly bald. So enough wild hair to really give him that crazy wizard quality. And then of course he loved to paint wizards and the such beautiful watercolor artist. So I'm trying to, in some ways, evoke the friendliness and the gentleness of Dennis Nolan. Yes. Maybe one of these days Dennis will get to see me paint this and I'm sure we'll see some magic smile come out of it. short amount of time. I'm going to work on this just a few more minutes and we'll call this done and then I'll pick it up and I'm sharing a little bit more of the experience face to face with my little Saturday painting, oil painting group. Catching him here in mid-talk, mid-speak. Let me put a little bit of a highlight on that wet little lip there. Folks, just a little bit of a smile. As I told you, I don't want to put too many of those super polished highlights on here, but just enough. Even if I cover it up in my overpainting, it'll peek through a little bit.
One of the things that I always suggest when painting with oils, knowing that the paint will be dry, usually the next time I come back to it, I check and I look if there's anything that I don't want to be there. Edges, lips, globs, goobers, whatever you might want to call them. I tend to soften because when painting, it's easier, much easier to paint and soften an edge while the paint is wet than it is to try and come back and create the illusion of softness later. Because I can always make that line hard again, but it is very difficult to make that edge soft after it's already been hard. I have to put a lot more paint on it and cover it up. So that's what I'm doing there. Enjoy.